Okay, this is the second part of understanding how we take care of two-dimensional vibrations and make it into something that has a, a wonderful quantum mechanical as well as classical story. Um, and uh, also, um, I want to make a, a point about uh, the field of ellipsometry, which is a very a powerful way to look at all sorts of phenomena. But uh, the first four topics here <coughs> look uh, formidable, but we're going to uh, try to break them down so that you see uh, very uh, quickly how this little simple A, B, C, D uh, Hamiltonian be <coughs> becomes, excuse me, becomes uh, a uh, exponential that makes it possible to basically write down the complete eigen solutions, including eigenvalues and eigenvectors, uh, very quickly. That's a nice piece of algebra. But the most important part of this, which is going to be shown in the center of the lecture, uh, is that it lets you visualize uh, what uh, is happening in a number of different ways that complement each other as far as the actual mechanics, be it quantum mechanical or classical. Analogies are a good thing, and that's what is <coughs> really happening here. <coughs> okay. Uh, let's just get started here. The first part of this is a little bit of a review of what we did in the uh, preceding uh, lecture 22, which has um, little notes uh, that will refer back uh, to them like that right there. This is the uh, discussion of this machine, uh, this Euler machine, uh, that very few copies of this. There's only one at Joint Institute of Laboratory Astrophysics that was the first one that was built uh, when I was writing a paper about this for Reviews of Modern Physics. And one of the uh, instrument makers was fascinated by the picture. I had no idea that I was going to bit, you know, build an actual uh, one of these, but uh, uh, he said, we've got to build this. And so he did. And that's unusual, usually. A machinist aren't out looking for work, uh, but uh, he was more than a machinist. Anyway, uh, the one that you see in this room that looks like that is a uh, uh, outgrowth of that one. What we originally had, and this is the picture in reviews of modern physics, is a ring here and then another ring around that. That's the way you usually make a gimbal mount. But then we discovered that we, that impeded us from uh, studying all of the motions. So when I got to Georgia Tech, I said, let's see if we can build this just using quarter circles. And that's what you see uh, in, on the desk in, in, in front of us uh, there. In any case, uh, the idea that I want to get across uh, right now is just the idea of the Euler angles as coordinates, as uh, uh, parameters that describe uh, a state, a mechanical state of location, but that's going to correspond uh, to an oscillator um, that uh, is uh, in, in, in some sort of classical state or uh, to uh, some sort of spin. There's so many two-level systems uh, in our lore right now that every one of them uh, can use this and makes it uh, a, a very um, a powerful thing. Also, I want to point out that the usual diagram for Euler angles is uh, this one. And it is the one that just mostly turns people off. It's uh, an astronomer's diagram. And as you know, astronomers keep track of orbits uh, by where they rise and set. <laughs> so the intersections, the ascending node or the descending node of something that was uh, orbiting uh, would be of, the, of interest to them. The uh, point in the sky where uh, the, the perpendicular to that orbit uh, indicates is of no interest. It's just the opposite in atomic molecular physics. Uh, the, these, these directions are going to correspond to angular momenta or uh, some, something, in this case spin angular momenta. And uh, the angles to that line are what we'll be considering 
uh, here, and of course, uh, all of that's going to be taken care of by three dials, alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha for azimuth, beta for theta, it rhymes with theta, which is the uh, second polar angle of an ordinary polar coordinate system. If that was all there was to it, it would just be a uh, vector here that couldn't do anything else. But this vector can twist. That's an azimuth in the frame of this uh, ball or molecule, and that's where uh, we really were, were uh, first doing this uh, machine, is to help people understand uh, the coordinates of a rotating molecule, something that we'll talk about in later lectures. And it uses the same machine uh, to help understand uh, all of the mechanics. So uh, when it comes to locating uh, the direction of a spin whether it's a classical spin or a quantum mechanical one, uh, the, the uh, Euler angles are a big help. And the uh, thing that was uh, mentioned on page 69 to 70 of the previous lecture 22 uh, goes through the alpha, beta, gamma product, just as it is here, uh, step by step, and actually produces the uh, complex phasor version of a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator or a quantum uh, state that has a real and imaginary part of a psi 1 and a real and imaginary part of a psi 2. But we prefer to think of those in terms of phasors that have uh, a real axis and an imaginary axis uh, corresponding to some kind of position x and the imaginary uh, vertical axis to some kind of momentum uh, p for number one uh, state and then the same thing for number two state. So it, it's that analogy uh, which then uh, feeds very nicely into the origin of uh, this whole mathematics in 1862 by John Stokes for optical polarization. But if you're thinking of spin a half, that's electronic or protonic or neutrino even uh, uh, polarization spectroscopy. So um, the idea of polarization spectroscopy is throughout uh, uh, physics. Uh, the first uh, uh, is in 1862. Um, okay, so anyway, after you get done doing the alpha, beta, gamma, you end up with a state that was originally pointing in the, what we'll call a spin-up direction, moved over, first twisted to get a phase on it, uh, then tipped by beta, and then swung around by alpha. Uh, and that's what we showed using the Euler angle picture. Uh, and we'll, we'll see that one again uh, shortly here. So you end up with a spin in a box that has an x, y, and z component. Now, x uh, is what we, uh, uh, we, we call the A, uh, I'm sorry, the B bilaterally symmetric axis. The Y is that crazy uh, complex current carrying uh, colored green uh, component. And then uh, this uh, Z here is uh, what we call A, A for asymmetric diagonal. We'll keep going over that again as we go through uh, the arithmetic and algebra uh, associated with uh, this. Um, I'm going to advance uh, both of these uh, as we uh, go. Uh, that one actually is a little clearer than this one uh, for a reason I'm not understanding right now. So uh, the, the, the uh, next one is, a, is making a point of the fact that we need ways to visualize this mysterious stuff. We've got this state, and everything in it's going to move in general. Uh, that's really four dimensions that we're talking about here. There are also four dimensions here, counting the amplitude. Three angles, alpha, beta, gamma, and then an amplitude makes four. And um, the other thing that's of importance is that the um, the uh, the quadratic form that you make uh, out of those amplitudes 
and now this is a really a complex quadratic form, the kind that you have in quantum mechanics, but you also have in classical mechanics when you're doing an oscillation, and these are phasers. They're, you know, perfectly acceptable uh, to anyone that's really doing classical mechanics. But the uh, name is expectation value, and when we did this, and this is on page 74 and 76 of lecture 22, uh, when we went through this, we found that uh, we were getting numbers which were the uh, Cartesian uh, coordinates of the spin vector in polar coordinate form. So that justifies this uh, picture here. Uh, and the formulas that consist of, uh, there's the Z components, mm -hmm. which you would call, if you were Pauli or Jordan, uh, coming first. And then the next uh, component that's after that uh, besides the Z component, uh, is this one right here, and then this one right here, these two uh, right here, which they call X and Y, and we call this one the B and C, and this the A. Okay? So this A, the A for asymmetry, if you will, uh, this is a property of this oscillator, uh, a two-dimensional oscillator, you see. Uh, that has a value which we're going to indicate by the notation S sub A, and we really are referring to uh, the um, spin a vector component. That This is an expectation value, if you're talking quantum mechanics, of the spin angular momentum operator. And if you recall, uh, the very last one here is the, is the one that uh, is, shall we say, the most uh, uh, moving one. Uh, you use the color green to indicate that it's the one that gets currents moving. It's the one, and when you have chirality, that means you have a handedness. That means you have rotation. If it's positive, you have some right-handedness. If it comes out negative, you have left-handedness. And that jives very well with the fact that we have here uh, x1, p2 minus x2, p1. You should recognize that as x, p, y minus y, p, x, if we were naming the x and y polarizations uh, the way they're usually named. But we're not doing that. We're trying not to make this confusing. So we're using numbers for that. But nevertheless, that's the one that has the angular momentum associated with circular polarization. The others are more like statics. They're sort of dipole or quadrupole moments. This is definitely a quadrupole-like thing. It's given the name balance to match uh, the uh, operator for uh, the uh, angular momentum component of B, or X, uh, in Pali's language. And then finally, this one just doesn't do anything at all. It just makes things sit still. So it's totally colored red uh, for a stoplight as a opposite to uh, the green, which means go. So uh, that's the sort of thing that we want to look at as we study the dynamics, uh, uh, either classical or quantum, that this arithmetic or algebra uh, can give us uh, for these states. Now there's three ways to visualize that dynamics or the statics or whatever is going on. Uh, they're sort of sitting here one, two, and three. We've been looking at this one, the three-dimensional real. R3 is the name uh, that's usually given to it. Vector picture. This is a real vector with real components. All of the expectation values that we've written down here are real numbers. Polar coordinate, uh, polar coordinate labeled uh, Cartesian coordinates. And so that's, I guess, maybe the third way to look at the thing. The first way, and the primal way, is probably this one. It's just two phasers that are going around, changing their amplitudes, changing even their frequencies, uh, doing whatever uh, a two-level system could possibly do. And there are four dimensions there, for sure. But then there's another one that doesn't quite, at first, have the full four dimensions. And that's where you just plot the trajectory that you get from the real parts of these phasers. So you just take that and that and plot it, x1 and x2, forget about p1 and p2, and make something which 
uh, for most of the static things we'll talk about is an ellipse. It's an elliptical orbit in two-dimensional space. Exactly what we started with when we talked about being inside the sophomore physics Earth. Okay, so there are three really distinct ways uh, to visualize that complement each other. You can't uh, tell any one of these that you're the only one that you need. There's no Swiss Army knife uh, that uh, does everything. This does, is very useful. This is, of course, primal. And then this one is simple. Uh, and and uh, we'll see how that works. Dr. Harvey, can you go back to the previous slide? Oh, back to this one. No, back. Back to the one before that. Yes. Uh, oh, am I going the right way? Right which one is pseudo spin states here? This one. All this? Okay. And your question? So, you are considering this two level system as an effective? Yes, you're considering system. that thing. Okay? Which uh, satisfies the H equation, right? H times this is equal to partial re with respect to time. Mm -hmm. Well, I, right? Mm -hmm. of, the, of this. That's what we're doing. We're basically solving a differential equation, a couple differential equations, that is complex. Remember, we immediately wrote it in four real equations, and that's what sort of opened the door here. Okay, so the idea is to visualize that solution, to understand, uh, you know, ways to understand what it's doing. And so this is probably the simplest. Everything's real here. Mm -hmm. Turns out it has all the information this does if you can read the twist. Uh -huh. Because this is really a body, not just a vector. So that's not measurable usually, right? The phase? Only indirectly. Directly. You have to have another system like it and you let the two of them touch each other or get near each other. You see a beat. And that beat will include the oscillation of the phase. That, that's, of course... Uh, the problem with quantum mechanics is we can't see directly all of the variables that are going. But most of the uh, real ones here are, are very available. This, the, these are all easy to read. It's that last one, this tough guy. Y yes, Tease. Could you advance one more slide? Uh, because there, this is sort of introducing us once again to this concept of, of spanning the state space by operators. Yes. And you've uh, got I, it all um, laid out. Let's go ahead. I think there's more about that in the ones that come okay. uh, uh, here. Um, we'll, we'll do that uh, very shortly Which here. But I do want to... relates to the question you were asking. Yeah. Before I do that, though, before I... Um, and, and it's kind of right here in the center. Yeah. Okay. Um, this general spin state is got from a single state that you call original, say spin up. It could have been any other spin. Uh, and then you apply this operator, and that's how you label the coordinates of this state. And that's a really powerful thing to do. That is what group theory of physics is all about, in my opinion. Is that you characterize everything that's going on in there, not by just a, a lousy wave function. That's fine. Okay, the wave function will tell you some things. <laughs> and then when you put them together, it'll tell you more. But it's a lot more powerful to know that there's an operator associated with that. And this solves the Feynman path conundrum. You see, Feynman said that, well, let's just, we'll consider all possible classical paths uh, uh, and we'll add them up in a nice way and keep track of the phases and then just throw away all the ones that don't cohere, the ones that cancel out destructively, we'll forget about them, and lo and behold, will come uh, an eigenfunction or something that we're interested in. The trouble is there's an infinite, 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 infinite number of these damn paths. So what I say is, let's only consider the ones that belong to a group. Now the groups close under products, and that makes more paths. But finally, you have a denumerable set of 
call them Feynman paths, but they're, they're labeled by group operator. So that's what's behind the fact that I would like to use operators to characterize all states. And the other thing is operators have two sides. There's the inside that's associated with a, a victim, and there's the outside that's associated with whoever's doing surgery on the victim or the patient. Okay? And when you can see both of those at once, lab and body in this case, it gets very powerful. Uh, the quantum mechanics improves greatly from what we uh, have in all of our standard textbooks uh, now. So that, that point I want to make. Now, when it comes to uh, uh, drawing pictures, uh, ellipsometry, as detailed at the very end of the, this lecture, uh, unfortunately, it may be better it came first, but the idea is that these 3D real uh, S vectors here, just an S vector that goes around and has angles, describes the geometry in this uh, complex uh, spinner space. It's just showing you x1 and x2 here, because I threw away p1 and p2. But that already is something that we know is important for polarization analysis. It's certainly important for if you're a two-dimensional oscillator. There's the actual trajectory of the oscillator inside the Earth, right? But the uh, uh, idea is that the, the field of ellipsometry is, is so uh, growing uh, that uh, it, we can't afford not to mention it just for that reason. But the idea here is that this complex descri described ellipse okay, of any state corresponds to a single point on the Stokes sphere. That point right there for this one. That point right there. There's a Stokes vector, but the point, the one point describes that whole thing that labels it, you see. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why this is so much more powerful for visualization than this until finally you've learned all you can learn from this one. Then you go and you look at this one. And let's, we'll talk a little bit about the geometry uh, of the ellipses. Uh, uh, that's more than what we talked about when we did our quadratic forms, but it's related. Okay, so that's the deal. U2 world, okay, labeled by two complex phasers, driven by a complex operator called the Hamiltonian. Okay, and the Hamiltonian has associated with it an angular velocity, the thing that makes uh, the uh, spin vectors roll around, process, if you will, okay? and change from state to state to state uh, the actual uh, uh, phasers that are involved in the uh, two-dimensional uh, space, the orbits, uh, elliptical orbits. Okay? So the, the U2 world complex driven by this Hamiltonian, R3 world labeled by a 3D spin vector or just a point on a sphere, you have to tell what the amplitude is, but once that usually doesn't change that much. Uh, and if it does, fine, that's part of the dynamics. And, and, but the idea is the angular momentum, instead of angular velocity, comes up uh, there. And it's driven by that angular velocity, omega. That's your crank vector in this Euler angle machine that sits outside of the sphere and is ready with its suction cups to grab the sphere and turn it. Or it, or it, it could be a magnetic field like that is the most, as we showed at the last part of lecture 22, common uh, in the old days, nuclear magnetic resonance de developed by I, Robbie, Ramsey, and Schwinger uh, is the first real uh, evidence of all of this dynamics. Then comes another paper by Feynman, Vernon, and Heller which says, hey, it's not just magnetic field. Every two-level system can use that arithmetic. So that's a, a paper that came a few years after Robbie, Ramsey, and Schwinger. Now it's interesting, they have three authors. It takes three authors in order to do a two-state system. <laughs> okay. 
three Nobel Prize winning authors. <laughs> well, Feynman, Vernon, and Hellworth. Vernon and Hellworth are very accomplished physicists, just happened not to get Nobel Prize. But Robbie, Ramsey, and Schwinger, all three. Uh, not for this necessarily. Robbie gets it for this. Uh, uh, Ramsey uh, also partly. Uh, Schwinger's a whole other story that we'll come to maybe later. Okay, so those are the two worlds, uh, and uh, we're going to try to live in them. So the first thing that we need to do uh, is see how you define an operator, a Hamiltonian, by a crank vector, an angular velocity. Okay, we've already mentioned this, but it's worth repeating it uh, in this little review here. So here are the two things by, our, by the side. Here's the one that has a spin vector that's going to be moved by, and here's a picture of the, of the machine that's uh, sitting on the desk uh, before it got all nicked and uh, corroded, uh, with the uh, thing that's going to drive it, the crank factor. It's going to turn it by some angle, a three-dimensional angle vector. Okay, The vector is determined by uh, its polar angles, just like this spin vector is determined by its polar angles, uh, alpha and beta. This one is determined by an azimuth that we use lowercase uh, italic phi. And then the uh, polar angle, theta, also in uh, lower uh, case uh, italic theta. So phi and theta, those are your standard uh, uh, for physicists anyway, uh, designations of azimuth and elevation, I should say polar uh, uh, angle. Elevation is the complement of that, which turns out to be useful uh, later on. And that's going to uh, tell you uh, where the crank vector is. And the crank vector is then going to work on the spin that's in the center of this ball here, going right through the gamma dial of the Euler, third Euler angle, and then uh, twisting uh, somewhat uh, as the uh, crank uh, rotates, and we'll see uh, a little bit of that. And then uh, here, of course, is the azimuth of the actual ball, and there's the beta, or theta, of the ball, you see. So uh, it's this operator versus the Euler operator. It's this operator and state using, and I like to get Mr. Darbu involved in this, this is a geometry that, that figured out a lot of things about rotation quite apart from physics and uh, is famous for the idea that no matter where I put this ball, what angles I, I put it at, there are always two points, opposing points, that are located where they were before I moved that thing. That's kind of a, 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 a you know, hair uh, brain uh, wrestling uh, idea, but it's true. And basically that's because uh, when you have a crank like this, it does not move that point or the one on the other side. That, when you think of it that way, oh yeah, that's trivial. Okay, But uh, uh, that's not actually that trivial. Okay, So here are the two matrices associated uh, with uh, this uh, thing. Now, as I said, um, this computer is not capable of doing quite the resolution of this one, so we're going to make this one follow along. You can see it's, it's a better picture uh, than this one. Okay? Mm -hmm. But I can point at this one and then you can occasionally look at that one where it gets uh, uh, cranky. Uh, this one particularly, maybe we should switch over for that. There is once again the Euler angle, I call it a goniometer. Uh, the, that, that's what I use to uh, put crystals in the right place. And then here's the uh, crank that's going to work on that thing. Okay? Here's the alpha, beta, gamma setting routine. It has to be followed very carefully in that order or you don't get the uh, dial set uh, to alpha, beta, and gamma uh, correctly. But anyway, these three matrices, uh, actually there are only two matrices in here, a Z rotation and then another one that comes afterwards. This is the first one you do to set the uh, gauge 
or the phase of this thing, and then the other two are the ones that aim it at a certain azimuth and elevation. Okay, these two uh, right there are the dials that you'd be setting. And we've already gone through the uh, idea of taking this um, uh, matrix that you get and breaking it down into pieces. This is uh, something that's worth doing. Anytime you get a matrix in this business, it's a good idea to expand it in terms of good old uh, A, B, and C. That's uh, 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 the uh, X, Y, and Z Holly matrices. So uh, that's what's going on here is that this unitary matrix is being expanded and uh, the re result, as you can see, are these uh, products of sines and, and cosines. And that's what we're going to use to make a relationship uh, with the uh, matrix that we got on uh, page 43 to 44 that describes uh, this uh, operation by Darbu angles, the Darbu angles being uh, the phi and theta italic, uh, 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 and then a rotation angle here, which will be uh, attached with a time factor to an omega. An omega will be an angular velocity. That's what we're really interested in, is the angular velocity of the crank due to a magnetic field, say. Okay, the uh, Larmor precession, if you will, or a cyclotron uh, precession of some kind. Anyway, uh, here is the matrix that you get uh, by doing that. This is uh, page 43 to 44 in uh, lecture uh, 22. So we're going to put these two together, have them fight. Well, not really fight, we're going to equate them uh, to each other. Uh, and that is the uh, thing that's going to happen uh, next year. Now, notice two things. First, the Euler is simpler form. Euler's de definition, this alpha, beta, gamma. Uh, and it makes better coordinates. The coordinates are very easy uh, to see. Uh, for uh, the, this. Um, now, saying that I have a certain operator that gets me to those coordinates is a whole different thing. The other state definition lets us relate these two. Uh, and by relating, I mean I'm going to make them equal. So I need to use parentheses to describe the Euler angles so I can distinguish from the uh, three angles that correspond to the crank vectors of doings. Okay? That's the hard part of using operators to describe states, but we're going to do it because it's powerful once you get it working. John Marburger was an office mate at USC who thought, uh, had somehow gotten the misconception that this alpha was equal to that, this beta was equal to theta, and this gamma was equal to this. And, you know, he just had never checked it. I, he was very surprised when I said, no, they're far from the right. And that's when I decided I really need to write something that, that, so no one ever does that again. It may have been be what happened to John was that he then became dean at the University of Southern California. And then after he got to be that, he became president, not of the University of Southern California, but of the State University of New York. And then he became a, a director of Brookhaven. That was his career. So he, he never had to use this stuff. Really or he would have, you know, appreciated I think he did appreciate what I said. Anyway, so here are the coordinates that give you a phase coherence angle. This is the phase, actually the classical phase of the oscillator uh, coming out. Uh, and then a population inversion angle. 
a beta. That's how tipped from spin up you are. And you're inverted when beta goes through pi. Makes spin up to spin down. And then uh, as it goes around, the shadow of that vector uh, corresponds to the old oscillator that was used to describe spectral uh, oscillation uh, back in the times of Lorentz. And then there's the overall phase, which uh, nobody at that time had any concept, uh, the quantum phase, uh, if you will. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each of the four components here, which are you know very simple polar angles uh, combinations, and set them equal to a corresponding product of sines and cosines. Those, in this case, the Euler is the more complicated the, uh, than the Darboux, because the Darboux is doing the group theory. This thing is saying, hey, I have to do group theory? I was just setting up some coordinates here before. So that is what we do, and one by one, we equate their different expressions for a real part of first state, spin-off, say, momentum of the second state with a minus sign is this one, and it has to be equal to that, and then the uh, real part of the second level, uh, second uh, wave function, and finally the, the imaginary part with a minus sign of that. So it's these three equations that we need to solve to make it uh, uh, useful uh, stuff. So this is a gigantic four-dimensional polar coordinate conversion that we have to do to get this going. And that's what we're going to do now. Euler defined operator derived from Darboux and vice versa. You need that to make this work for you. So these are two routines you'd have to put in a computer. If you're going to use a computer to do all this stuff, uh, better get it right. Because <laughs> you're going to do it over and over again. Okay? So, uh, as we said, these make better coordinates of a state. These things make better parameters of an operation. And they are very simple polar coordinates. These are more like four-dimensional polar coordinates. This is just three plus one polar coordinates. Okay? That much of it is the usual three. Then we got this extra one that is the actual rotation. So there's some you know different views of four-dimensional geometry hiding in all of this. So the first one we're going to equate is that, and that's pretty easy to take care of. Then there's another one uh, that needs to be there, and you get that one as a ratio. The tangent of gamma minus alpha you get uh, right there. These cancel out. And so you have an equation there that can be inverted. And that's what the result is. So th this is a pretty simple linear relation. You don't see very many of those in this. <laughs> Gamma minus alpha over 2 is just the complement of the angle phi of the crank. That, that's uh, pretty cool. This one, the gamma plus alpha, is an arctangent of a combination that uh, um, involves a cosine and tangent of two different angles. So this gives the Euler angles in terms of uh, Darboux angles pretty nicely. Alpha and gamma are that, and then we got to find something for beta, and that's not hard to do. Okay, beta is just two times the arc sine of that that weird product there. Okay, but we want to go the other way too. Inverse relations, getting the Darboux in terms of Euler is not immediately seen from that, but you can pull two of them out and do little manipulation like that, and pretty soon you'll have uh, two of them, and then uh, the actual rotation angle uh, is perhaps the most complicated one. But you might expect that, because it's, it's based on all the others. Okay? So there you have it. Okay? Now, uh, let's do an example. Okay? This is an example that's in a photograph that follows uh, this. As I said, I'm going to uh, go ahead and 
advance this one uh, to the point because we need to have a clear picture of something that's going to be set to these angles. Normally I would try to set these angles. Now this picture is not quite as clear because the screen doesn't go as far, but uh, when we work these two screens together, we'll uh, come up with, thing, with an idea. The idea is that if I just set alpha, beta, and gamma to 50, 60, and 70, these formulas give me a phi of, of 80 degrees, a theta of 32.7. Now, this is where I'm setting these angles uh, right here. So, uh, for example, uh, this one probably is already set to 32.7. I have to make sure this one is close to 80. I think it is. And then there's a rotation angle right here, 128 degrees point seven, that will take this thing from the origin to the position described by these three angles, namely 50, uh, <coughs> 50, 60, and 7, for respectively alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay? Now, what's fun is to make this thing go in reverse. Just take what you got here, which are, of course, decimals here to uh, three or four figure accuracy. Okay? Do a reverse check using the uh, inverse formulas, and what do you get? You get alpha equal to 50.007, because we don't have enough places here to make it 50, and beta equal to 60.022, because, again, not enough places, and gamma is 70, not 70, but 70.002. 007. That's the James Bond angle right there. Okay? <laughs> well, let's see what this looks like on an actual photograph. And as I said, we can do this with a real machine, but I, I think that um, there's less to be gained. In this case, the uh, uh, image on this screen is perhaps a little easier to see uh, than the one on the other. Now, I should mention that TC is, un is busily constructing uh, a, a virtual Euler angle machine. I won't look at that right now simply because uh, it's not done. But you can go and, and play with a little bit. You can move things around. But this is what we're, we're after here. What we've, we've done here is um, we've set uh, this thing uh, up so that it, it gives uh, an original state with the setting that's there, namely uh, those uh, th the, the angles that I was talking about here, 33 degrees uh, off of the top for the, uh, the theta of this thing, and then it should be located uh, at um, a, uh, let's see if I've got the uh, thing here, um, see, see, see. Uh, yeah, the, I, I've got to set the, the, the um, I've got to set this thing, uh, so this thing is at 80 degrees, uh, this thing is at 33.69, and then right now the crank hasn't been turned, so that's zero degrees. But remember we need to get uh, 128.7, uh, so we turn the crank to 127, the whole thing r rolls over a little bit, and when I get to that uh, to 128.68, actually, uh, you will see that the Euler angles have fallen into a line, if you read each of these dials, 50, 60, 70. So that's the beginning of a voyage that we're going to take as we turn this angle, this crank, all the way through uh, to 2 pi. And it's just almost there in that picture. In the next slide, it is there, and the ball is returned to the exact position, but the Euler angles and the arms that hold the ball are in different position. They're opposite side. One of these has a positive polar angle of beta. This one has a negative polar angle beta. And that, that's what's uh, very spooky. So this machine is doing that business that I talked about of going uh, with spin uh, up to spin down and then minus 
uh, spin up and I have to go another 360 degrees in three space to get the finish of the two space rotation which only goes half as fast. And so that's what's being done here. We do another, we come out here at 660, we're almost home to that. Okay? So that, at 720, we're home. 360 times 2, we're home. That, that by itself is, is, is amazing. Now, um, let me show you practical applications of this. And this is a picture in Scientific American of a table with a tape. And the t this would correspond to the arms of our Euler angle machine. Of course, you can't do anything to really quantify the tape. It's twisting, 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 and finally returning back to that. It doesn't have a twist in it when you get done. It gets sort of a half twist, and then it has a half untwist uh, to get it back. And that was patented as a way uh, to put uh, wires, cables of all kinds, into a rotating table. The idea is the table has to be supported by something that makes it go around this way half as fast as this one uh, is, is turning. It has to be a two to one ratio uh, of this rotation to that and then it will duplicate this. And then there's an optical version of this where you have prisms and the prisms is carried around, you see, at, at uh, basically twice, the, I'm sorry if I said half, I meant twice uh, the uh, rotation here. And the image that you will see uh, in the mirror prisms is doesn't move. So you are able to look and be in the rotating frame uh, of this. And if it was uh, being done continuously, there could be balls that were going in, in uh, straight lines, but they would, would be, be, be looking like they were going in, in uh, Coriolis curves uh, in that uh, image. So this is, I think, what this really shows is the peculiarity of our connectivity of our three-dimensional space. Now, I can simplify this by um, taking, and I meant to get a cup of water, which is more, more uh, easier to uh, see. This is good enough. It won't spill if I, I fail to do what I'm about to do. And that is, without breaking my wrist or my elbow or my shoulder, I want to rotate this thing completely around. Now, I'm not, I can't go much further than that, but I can do this, you see. Now, it's pointing at you, right? I can bring it down here so it's pointing at me and then I can point it at you and then I can just keep on going around. It's kind of ugly right there, but that's the other part of the four pi that I need to bring this back to you. Okay? So this is something you can just do with a glass of water, right? And, and if you're very dexterous, you could probably do it without spilling the water. So how much angle is for the difference? It went around twice, just like the machine. Yeah. Had to go around twice. Had to untwist, twist my arm, and then untwist my arm to get it back to where it started. And this was just a connectivity associated with three-dimensional space. To me, it's, un, you know, it's mind-boggling. Very beautiful. <clears throat> so there's a machine and there's your arm. This is, every majorette can do this with a baton that's on fire. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then, and, and I suppose in India they have people that can do things like that with both on, right? It, it's really an amazing uh, motion. Okay. Now let's see a practical application for just doing the algebra of finding eigen solutions. This is uh, certainly uh, worth an effort uh, to, to understand because if you have a graduate uh, qualifying exam, it's very possible you'll be given a 
matrix of some kind, and you definitely want to find the eigenvectors if it's a Hamiltonian or a density power, you know, any, any sort of quantum mechanical thing, uh, certainly. But for classical oscillators, too. Now, we've, we've got powerful ways to do this with our item potent projectors and all of that, but this is basically a write down. Much easier for this, this particular one. Of course, you can always go and check it. But the idea, you see, is that we expanded that Hamiltonian. That's the first thing we did was write it in terms of sigmas, not the S's. But then we, we, we changed that a little bit by, by putting a one-half, you see, on the, the, these guys uh, uh, here, uh, these, these operators, you see, and making them into the things that came out with, with half point of momentum. And then this one was twice as fast, bigger, than the lowercase omega a omega b that we had written. Uh, at first, uh, when we were doing the uh, expansion, ABC expansion. Now, <clears throat> this step one, of course, is do the expansion of this. That's pretty easy. But uh, then convert the Cartesian A, B, and C, that's uh, X, Y, and Z, into uh, a, a, a polar form. There's the Z-like polar form, there's the X-like polar form, and there's the uh, Y-like polar form, with both of them having sine, and this one has a cosine, and they have the, the two projections on the uh, X and Y axis, right? Okay, so you got to do that, and then you've got to note that not only do you have an omega zero here, it's the fourth dimension of all of this, but you have an omega that's the sum of the squares of these things. Sums of squares of these uh, numbers here, a minus d, 4b, and 4c. So we're reading those numbers out of whatever this Hamiltonian is, and we're getting the eigenvalues, basically, that we need. It's plus and minus that. Okay? Omega plus and minus, that is this thing, plus and minus that thing over 2. Remember, we made it twice as big. Well, if you're interested in eigenvalues in spinner space, you want 1 half. And we'll see what uh, that is. But there is the actual answer for the eigenvalues uh, of this Hamiltonian. These are angular velocities, these omegas. Good name for it. So here's what you're seeing. You're seeing a total omega in the beat frequency, the group uh, motion of the wave function, which is very observable, the individual frequencies are not directly observable. And of course, the zero one right here is, is something else. You can, you can change your origin for frequency. That's part of gauge transformations of any spectrum uh, of levels. But the difference is what makes something move. So this is the actual beating that you're going to see if you mix these two states. It's going to be at that frequency omega, twice omega over 2. So that takes care of the eigenvalue discussion. Then we've got to find the, the uh, polar angles that are associated with the crank vector. And that's not a hard thing to do. You just undo the polar angles with an arc cosine, uh, say, it's not the only way to do it, two arc cosines here, uh, or this, if you want to write it in terms of the, of the uh, omega b and c. Okay, so that, that gives you theta and phi. We already had the omega part, so we're kind of done. We can just plug the um, numbers uh, phi into alpha. We can plug the theta, that's uh, this guy here, into the beta. In other words, we can do what Mr. No, Marburger uh, wanted. He wanted to equate those. Now, why is that? Why would I do a thing like that? I would uh, let the Darboux polar angles be alpha and beta. 
Why would I want to do that? Because I want to line the spin vector up with the crank. I want them to have the same polar angles. Okay? So this guy right here, this polar angle is going to go right there. And this azimuth that's right here is going to go right there. This guy is going to appear uh, right where the alpha is and the other one where the beta is. The gamma is still up for grabs, but uh, that's all I need to know for an eigenvector because either the uh, gamma sits outside of this thing, you can put any phase you want, and it's not going to change its, its ability to be an eigenvector. But that's only one eigenvector. Where's the other one? Well, there are two ways to line the spin up, up or down, to the crank. So one of those is going to be theta plus or minus pi, and either one will work. So that's what I, I say uh, when I say gone in 60 seconds. Now, when you do this, if you're doing it with a calculator, you want to use an A tan too. That is, you want to use a polar uh, vector linear conversion routine of some kind. An A tan too, if you're programming, is much better than just the arc tangent of C over B. There you feed in both C and B separately, and it can tell you what quadrant you're in. You could easily make a mistake, but. Uh, getting the arc tangent wrong. So, as the old movie of car theft in 60 seconds, remember, gone in 60 seconds? Okay, well this is a solution to an, an eigenvalue problem, gone in 60 seconds. And wouldn't that be nice on a quantum exam, right? Or qualifying exam. Okay, you, this problem, 60 seconds, now it's like you have one less of the four problems you have to solve, right? Bingo, you got three things to do. Uh, got time, more time. Okay, so you're given that thing. You got to write it as uh, 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 the b minus i c and the b plus i c. Okay, so there are the numbers that we're, we're playing with. Convert to polar form. Okay, first you get your omega. Okay, so we get an omega here of eight. I made it so that it came out a nice even number, and that's what they'll do for your exam too, if they're nice, right? And they are. We're very nice, <laughs> not like Donald Trump. So, uh, and then that gives you an eigenvalue, okay, plus or minus this uh, square root here, okay. So there are your, your two frequencies, 14 and 6, okay. Now you want to know what the vector's going to look like. You stick those guys up there. If they're nice, they've given you something that comes out of pi over 3 or pi over 4. Or even better, just comes out real. Okay? So there you are. That could be done. I've done it in 30 seconds. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not going to take very many minutes, and you can check it a number of different ways. So that's a very practical thing. That's algebra. Now, the rest of this is about visualization. What is it that you actually see? Uh, both in the simulations, which can let you see phases, but in the experiment, which will not let you see that, but it'll be seeing some other things. Uh, when, and if it's classical mechanics you're talking about, of course you can see the phase. That seems like a paradox, but the, uh, all of the oscillators that we play with in the, in the classical world are coherent states of a quantum oscillator. That's sort of mind-blowing, but uh, it, according to what we know now, that's, that is very true. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to show you some simulations that uh, TC has put together that mirror um, simulations that we had written before on a program called Color U2, which um, is getting slowly brought up to the, uh, the, the web's uh, availability. So here uh, we look again to see what the crank uh, vector is. And uh, what we've got with an A-type motion is just a Hamiltonian that doesn't have a diagonal non-zero component. Just A and D is all it's got. Okay? So it's only going to be a linear combination of sigma A, then there'll be the unit operator that's added in as well. Okay. 
So we're going to have an omega a sub a of a minus d, but the other two are zero. So this is a crank that's sitting right on the a axis. Now, a axis means z axis for Pauli and company, right? So th that's the situation that uh, we have. Now, this is the old color U2 uh, association um, animation, uh, which um, I hope I don't have to use uh, here because um, I can get a simulation going uh, that actually will do something like that. And that's available by, if you're uh, reading this on the <coughs> web, uh, should be able to get it by clicking on that. Now, I'm going to have to advance the one that I'm actually going to click uh, over here, since it gives a better picture, but also uh, is faster. This is a better computer. So I'm going ahead here through our 60 second thing and coming out uh, with something that will rotate us uh, around the A axis. That's where the crank is. And so that's what it's going to do. It's going to rotate us around that. So let's go ahead and uh, move over to that screen and I will click on uh, that particular uh, link and there you can see and I probably better sit down because I want to play with this a little bit there you can see uh, what we've got now uh, what I want to do is I want to turn on the uh, stoke space for this thing the way you do that let's just pause it open the control and uh, set it so I can draw the Stokes vector. Okay? That needs to be clicked, right? Mm -hmm. uh, anything else you can think of that I need here? Not at this point. I don't care about the fractions right now. So I'll, I'll skip that. And so we'll just... Uh, uh, st you can uh, turn off the mode phasers. It might be a little less congested. Oh, okay. Let's, let's get rid of them for the mo moment. It keep that one. Those are your basic size. Uh, just to the these guys here. Yeah. Get rid of them. Yeah. Okay. That'll make it a little cleaner. Okay. Let's reset at zero. And let's see where. Where? Let's see where is the Stokes? Ah. Uh, um, I bet I have to clean the cache. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Let's go. That's something else that you, whenever these routines change, you won't get the change always unless you uh, clean that. So let's just uh, go ahead and pause this thing again. This is Chrome. So uh, to get uh -huh. that, uh, I do a clear browsing data. Right. Okay. So, and that's, that's what will happen here. So I'll clear the browsing da data. And then I'll uh, uh, just jump back here uh, to our uh, routine and click on it again. Okay? I could look at the history, I suppose, but that wouldn't be a good thing to do. Maybe There's the Stokes vector. Okay? Right there with a um, Mohs vector. Now, what does this mean? I mean, the whole idea here is that this is a two-level system that has no coupling between the levels, right? I've taken the spring out. It's like these two pendulums over here. No spring between them. It's just the fact that they can wiggle on their own, right, at different frequencies in general, right? So, for example, what I can do is I can just say, say oh, I'm going to just wiggle this one. And it, you know, and I'm a little bit of wiggle there because I didn't quite get it right on. It's, it's hard to get rid of the other one, but that, that's what you've got. Is uh, number one just sits there and oscillates at its frequency. Okay? Its frequency is uh, one unit uh, on this uh, thing. The other one is supposedly two. But, um, Here's the other one right here. 
And then all of this other motion is just uh, some combination of those two. I'll erase the paths, okay, and turn on a little bit of this one while I turn on the other one. That means I'm going to have this plus the other one, and then uh, I get the Stokes vector to move, right? So if I uh, only have this one going right here, and let's just have it a little bit wobbly, okay? I only have it going and then a little bit of the other one, right? Like that. Well, now the spin vector is going around the crank vector with a little tiny circle, okay? And I try to make that smaller by getting closer and closer to the axis. Now you can hardly see it uh, moving, right? Or I can make it do this one, uh, you know, just sort of sloppily go up here and set this one. Now it's, it's a spin vector processing around the crank on the back side, you see. And I try to improve that by getting in the center of it. And I'm getting close to the eigenstate that is the down, say, uh, state. Down relative to the A axis, which is the Z axis in, according to Pauli and company, right? So this, this A type motion is pretty simple, right? If this was all there was to it, we wouldn't need all this hardware or theory or matrices or anything else. So the next, the next step here, uh, I'm going to go ahead um, on this uh, window here and remind you that's what we're, we're talking about. Uh, I want to go to the B type motion because that's what we started all this with. We started this thing with a V operator that gave me an off-diagonal uh, matrix that was bilaterally symmetric, okay? And that means uh, that it was really giving us modes that are at 45 degrees, bilaterally bisecting uh, X and Y uh, axes in the oscillation or a polarization plane, okay? And maintaining these two equal. So I only have the unit operator now, which we always have. Can't get rid of it because you need a phase, you need a heartbeat. Uh, but uh, you, here I'm just going to have one of these three, this one. Okay? So that puts me uh, uh, with uh, an omega of 2b right here. It was a minus d for the first one. It's 2b for this one, it's going to be 2c for the next one, example. No, so let's... Now we have interaction, right? Pardon? Now you switched on the interaction, right? Now you... Now the interaction is on, right? Because yes. We have a coupling uh, right here, but nothing making these things be different. Mm -hmm. So all the beating is going to come from B for beats. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay? So uh, let's go over uh, on this one. I'm going to make him pause so that he doesn't try to go in the background here and do funny things. Uh, go ahead on this to the uh, B-type uh, one that shows the uh, thing happening here. I'll, I'll go ahead and finish that and we can look at that later and I can do the same thing on this screen right here. This is what we're basically going to see, but let's see it. It's, it's hard to see what's going on without actually seeing the movie. And so that's what I'll start right now here. And the Stokes is already on. So th this is a beautiful example, which really needs to be slowed down. So I'm going to reach up in here and see if I can bring this thing uh, down. Not by a 10, I'll, I'll bring it down uh, just to uh, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. Let's start over. Reset t equals zero. We start with x polarization, if this is the x-axis, and we work our way around with these things at 90 degrees, work our way around 
to Y polarization. Okay? And then we come back. That's been a half beat. Okay? Now this one is uh, driving that one. And you can check to see that this one is 90 degrees ahead of that one. Right? So all the stuff we talked about before is happening. And watch this. That is actually the turnaround point there. I want to do that again later. But the idea is that we don't return home here after one of these beats. We end up with a minus sign. That's that idea of having to go 4 pi. And it isn't very mysterious here, is it? This makes it very, very clear uh, uh, what that is. Let's do that one more time. Reset t equals zero. Now, that meant it started here, right? And what I need to do is be real uh, quick here on the pause button. So now um, we're we're reaching the quarter wave plate uh, timing, okay? So now I have Y polarization. That would be what a quarter. If I just stop now, I've got, I've got all of the energy out of here and down there. But I'm getting ready to return home here. You see, I'm getting ready to return uh, the, this thing at the top. So I have to be very careful with this. And that is it right there. That is the, the place where it's the top. And this one is down, not up. It's on this side, not there. You can see the, the line. That's the finish right there. I have to keep going uh, to get it to uh, come back to the right side. So you might say, there's a whole beat. No way. That's a half beat. And indeed, the envelope for this thing goes here and then goes down over here. So an engineer would say, yeah, you just have a half beat if you're really looking at the envelope going up and down. And let me get ready to stop this thing uh, where it really is uh, coming home. Oh, I, I didn't. I missed it. I, <laughs> I'm always a little slow on things like that. But... Uh, you go. you go ahead and play with it. Right. You'll, yeah. you'll see. Right there. There it was. I didn't mm -hmm. miss it. It was right mm -hmm. there. That's what mm -hmm. I'm talking about. Yeah. So I had to do, I really had to do two of these. That's what, that's what confused me. I had to do two of those. Go there to there, and then there to there. Okay. Let's look at C, the curling, cyclotron, centrifugal, chiral, complex. Professor Harder, uh, you might have mentioned it before, but for the new viewers, that actually is a control panel uh, in the main configuration space plot. So if you're wanting to investigate how you map to Stokes space, you can just go in with your cursor and select point. C-type motion. This is uh, where we just have 2C, and now we're going to be rotating around uh, the C-axis. Now this one we can visualize uh, rather easily just by looking at this picture, and then I want you to see it actually in motion. But what we've got here is a picture of the aim uh, vibration which is not an eigenstate, it's as far from being an eigenstate as you can be. It's on the equator of the crank vector. So it's going for a big ride. And that big ride consists of its rotating, what's called Faraday rotation, of polarization just straight to 45 degrees and then beyond, you see. Now this is a vibration that's pointing this way, now it's 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 pointing that way, now it's pointing that way, now, oh, I went around once and I obviously have a minus phase, right? This one you can see right here. Very clear. 
C really exposes that. Okay, so that's what we hope to see uh, in Faraday rotation. Let's uh, come back on to the uh, thing and go ahead on this one to the C-type motion and look at the eigenvectors too when we uh, get this going. But here it is. I'll simply click on that. Uh, you were a little low. I was a little low. You advanced right. a page. I've got to uh, get back uh, to that. There we go. There we go. So this is the A-type motion being swung around the C-axis. Unlike this picture, the C-axis is up uh, where Y shouldn't be, uh, but that's, that's a fine way to do it. I, perfectly all right. Most people would like to make C the Z-axis, and uh, all this formalism will let you do that. But there is an example of the thing going around, and it does have to go around two times to come out right at that moment there, you see, on this side. It took two beats uh, to accomplish that. But you can see the phases between those things are really changing. This isn't anything like the B uh, type behavior. This is Coriolis behavior. Centrifugal uh, and Coriolis going on uh, here uh, with the um, uh, dynamics of the oscillator. And uh, it will happen with any uh, I'm going to go ahead and lower this again so it's a little bit slower. It will happen with any uh, practically uh, thing that I, I start this thing out. I, I'm making, trying to make an ellipse. It'll never close, you see. That ellipse will rotate around, making a circle uh, finally full of, a, of, a, of tips and ellipses. You see. The only thing that's an eigenstate for this thing uh, going that way would be uh, something uh, that where I go up here to uh, one unit and go across here. Uh, if I do that, I can make something that's a pretty good eigenstate. Not perfect. I didn't aim perfectly, but. It's very close to right circular polarization. Mm -hmm. Now the spin vector is up the omega crank, mm -hmm. right? Right here. And uh, it's very easy for me uh, with this uh, setup here to erase the paths and go the other way. You see, as high as I am, I try to make a square. Um, I, I couldn't read the numbers there, so I couldn't tell exactly where I should put it. But that will be pretty close to an eigenstate. Not as close as the one I just made. You can see where, where they are uh, down here. Now I'm down the crank with a spin vector. Okay, so the, the, this is the way you understand the dynamics of this. And one thing that you can do uh, with this, I'm going to uh, erase the paths and pause here real quick and go in here and let one phaser ride on the other and then resume. And you can see what it's actually doing. <laughs> the right-handed phaser is being taken on a trip in the left-handed direction. We're going to talk about that later, the hypocycloid motion uh, that you would get if it was actually uh, something rolling uh, on a bigger, a bigger circle. But that is uh, sort of sums up the focal uh, motion uh, that you get. Um, if you uh, don't quite make the thing, if you make them about equal size, then you get a, you know a complicated a pattern of Faraday rotation, and you can see how it's being made. One of these is higher frequency than the other. So you either process this way or you process that way. Remember when we were talking about the eyeball and trying to figure out which way something would process. This is much clearer than 
what we had to work with uh, there. Mm -hmm. So that gives you some feeling for uh, how powerful uh, these visualization tools can be. Okay, I'm going to pause there. And now, uh, the one that's going to be really hard for us uh, is the mix when you mix these guys. These are all pure A, B, or C. But um, what I want to go to next is not so pure. But it's, this is the simple case of not so pure. And I'm going to do it with this one too. What we're talking about here is some mixture of A and B. Some mixture of A here and B there, which is going to be a crank vector somewhere there, or maybe down in here even. That could go the other way with that crank vector. Right? So, uh, what this is going to uh, give us is a fast and slow axis of a potential that's tipped. This is where A and D are not equal. I have a B, and I'm making these things uh, more or less equal. Uh, I can finally uh, make them equal and, and sort of opposite to this one. In that case, the slow axis is right at 45 degrees. This is B symmetry. Here, it's A symmetry. But AB symmetry has got uh, this sort of complicated behavior that uh, results uh, from having uh, that. Now, uh, if we click on that one, what you do is you get an eigenstate that is not level with the x-axis. This would be a, um, and let me slow this thing down again. Uh, that's almost too fast. We'll go down here to two. That ought to be slow enough. If I go right in the center of that, let me erase the paths. If I go right in the center of that, I'm pretty close to an eigenvector now. And what you've got is mostly number one motion. It's favored, has big amplitude, you see. And it's faster than this one. This is the slow one down there. So they're out of phase. You see how they're out of phase, 180, more or less? 